It's good. Again, great to see you this morning. Grab your Bible, turn to um, Exodus 20. We've started uh, this new series. If you were with us last week, you saw this. If not, you can catch right up. Uh, looking at the Ten Commandments throughout the summer, in fact, throughout the entire summer. And uh, immediately, when you think about the Ten Commandments, I know a lot of us think, or people in our culture think, studies prove this, that, wow, that was a long time ago. And how relevant are these Ten Commandments, really? And uh, so last week we said that they were uh, given to us out of a heart of love. God gives us His relationship, or, or His rules, if you will, His laws, out of a heart of love. We noted that He didn't give them the Ten Commandments, His people, while they were still in Egypt. He rescues them uh, out of slavery. He brings them through you know, the miraculous salvific moment of the Red Sea, of the salvation moment for the people of Israel. He brings them on the other side. So by faith, they follow after him. He says, hey, I've rescued you now. Relationship. He establishes a relationship with the people. This is always the way it is with us. He rescues us. He enters, we enter into a relationship with him. Then come, here's how to live. Okay. So uh, out of love, he gives us his commands. We noted last week that uh, the first command, there's only one God, right? There's only one true God. It's possible to worship a false God, if you will. There's no other gods, but it's possible to think, we're going to talk about this today, that we're worshiping or something becomes a functional God for us. There's only one God. Now, the second command we're going to look at today is this thing of graven images. Um, And what we're getting to today is this. It's possible to worship, perhaps, the true God in the wrong way, which really is no worship at all. Last week, we looked at His commands come to us out of a heart of love. And we said for every negative command, all right, for all the thou shalt not, this is great parenting, by the way, little advice, teaching our kids. For every negative command are two positive reasons. The first one is protection, and the second is provision. To to protect us from something, Uh, that's harmful, and then to provide something better for us. You take every negative command, and you can do this. This is why God says, don't, all right? Thou shalt not. And so several of the commands are, thou not all of them, but thou shalt not, thou shalt not. So again, the first commandment is don't worship a false god. The second is let's, let's, let's see how we perhaps get off track and we don't worship him as we should. Um, Often I have quoted um, A.W. Tozer's kind of famous quote, which is this. He says, what comes into our minds when we think of God is the most important thing about us. This quote is especially uh, applicable today, uh, relevant in this message right here today. Because we're going to think about this thing of graven images. uh, And, and, you know, whatever we create is first is in our minds, right? Right. So I hope you have your Bible. Again, Exodus 20, you can see it there, verses 4 through 6 is what we're going to look at. And before we jump there, I want to set it up like this. Many of you have read the story um, of Aladdin, or more likely you saw the Disney film some years ago, right, kids? Anybody seen Aladdin? So the story of Aladdin is the story of this, this, um, gosh, he's really a peasant, orphan, um, young Middle Eastern boy who is, uh, ultimately finds the lamp. He goes into the cave of wonders. Um, and like any Disney film, you know, so much, there's, there's a lot of sub-stories. One is, of course, that you know, you're the great prince. Within you, there's a prince. And you know, that kind of story, the obligatory, you're awesome. Okay. Um, and then there's also you know, his pursuit of Jasmine, who is the, the, you know, the, the princess. And he's just a commoner. So there's that story going on. He finds himself in the cave of wonders, and he ends up with the lamp, right? And so in the lamp is the genie. Who, who comes out, this all-powerful genie, been confined in there, trapped in the lamp all this time. Whoever grabs the lamp, whoever has the lamp, becomes the master of the genie. So he's given three wishes. And the whole story then goes on, and it gets wild and crazy. In fact, before uh, the ultimate wish is for him to set the genie free, um, Jafar, the evil sultan, ends up with the lamp, and he has all the, he wants more power. He wants this thing to make him now all powerful. He, his last wish is to become the genie himself. And so he ultimately does. Jafar becomes the genie, not realizing that seeking to be all powerful, he ends up being enslaved, trapped in the lamp himself. It's a really wild story when you get underneath it theologically. Sorry, I see all the world this way. But um, what happens here is this this thing between all-powerful a genie who lives and is confined in this little space. 
And the story for us, this is the story of our lives. We want to take our God, the all-powerful God, we want to bring Him into close proximity. We want to put Him in a box that we can understand, that we can kind of rub and say, I'll call you out when I need you, right? And by the way, I want you to provide all of my wishes, my desires, so ultimately He becomes, or we become our own God, And little do we know, when we turn God into an idol like that, we confine Him and we define Him in our own terms, we become trapped ourselves. So here's what I want to talk about today. The question is this, how can we be set free from the idols that imprison us? All right, so let's let's talk about it. First, freedom from idols. Freedom from idols. First thing we have to do, we got to shut down the idol factory, all right? If you take notes, you can write these just three points today. Exodus 20, verse 4. God is saying, stop making idols. Look at what he says. You shall not make for yourself a carved image or any likeness of anything that is in the heaven above or that is in the earth beneath or that is in the water underneath the earth. What's he saying? He says like anywhere, nowhere, no time do you make any image that looks like anything that you might find anywhere. So the Israelites, they're living in this land of idols. Think about it. They were in Egypt where they have like 29 major idols, gods, and they had 2,000 lesser gods. Now it's, 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 surprising for many to believe that this still happens today. If you've been on mission trips with us to places like uh, India or Nepal, literally they they go and worship idols that have been made by human hands. I saw a a husband, a father with kids, and he went, we went to this Hindu temple. He's gathered around this, this idol cow and he's whispering in the ear of the cow, believing that somehow it's going to answer his prayers and bless his family. And I mean, it's just idols all over the place. And it's hard to believe in our day that this is actually happening. But these people actually saw that. This was Egypt. And this was the land of Canaan. All around them, they were, a, a, they were to be a unique people. Okay, so God calls them out. And, and like all of us, they're in a new place. It's kind of scary. And when we're scared, we always go back kind of to what we know. And God says, no, 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 no. You're going to be different. You're not going to be like all the other nations. He says to us, you're not going to be like the world. I'm calling you out. I am God. And here's what, he, here's what he's teaching them. I'm spirit. You cannot put me in any image that you've come up in your mind. Anything that you make, I will not be confined. How about this? I will not be your genie. I am God. I'm spirit and I'm eternal. You can't bring me into a temporal piece of wood or something fashioned by hand, graven image right now this was revolutionary is what i'm trying to get you to see second commandment is revolutionary because no one in the ancient world could imagine worshiping a god that was just spirit out there had to see it lay hold of it because they believed that that was not only the god but that was where the the power of that god was housed much like the lamp essentially god is saying I won't be your genie. All right, now, at first reading in our sophisticated modern culture that we live in today here in North Dallas, we're thinking, is this really relevant? In fact, studies would show us that this commandment, uh, people think is like, nah, not so much. You know, thou shalt not kill, uh, that is a good one. Okay, you know, don't murder people, that's good. Don't steal, don't lie, those are good. This one, people say, ah, no. And I'm going to argue today, this may be the most relevant of all, apart from the first one, Okay. Because think about it, who, who has images? Um, in, I mean, who really runs after uh, images like this? Uh, who, who has uh, images in their culture? I just want you to see a few of them here, all right? Uh, because as we think about this, um, none of us would have images that we would run to. Think about this, give our hearts to, give our lives to. None of us would say, I'm going to give my money to this thing. It's going to rearrange my schedule. I'm going to find worth and identity in this. Who does this? Nobody does this in our day. We don't have images in our day, right? We have them. I, I could say it this way. We're nothing like them. That's right. We're much more proficient than they ever were in creating our idols. All of us do this. And we all run to idols and images that we have created in our minds that we produced. And I'm going to step on some toes today, okay? 
You're already seeing, I love my longhorns, you know, or whatever that is that you love. I love the cowboys. Idolatry is what that is. All right. No, but we're going to sort through this. And I want you to really think deeply with me about this because there are so many idols. It was Nietzsche who, who got a lot of things wrong, but he was the philosopher who said there are more idols than there are realities. John Calvin, the great reformer, is the one who said the human heart is an idol factory. The first thing we've got to do is identify our idols so we can shut down the idol factory. So what is an idol? This is where I'm trusting God. I've been praying that the Spirit of God would really speak into your heart at this time. And you would identify. You'd be bold enough to identify. And then we confess, repent of our idols. Okay, first of all, anything we trust, love, or serve more than God himself. And immediately we think, well, I don't, no, I don't, I don't do that. God is God. He's the, listen, to put faith in something is to trust in something. Meaning, I'm going to trust this thing is going to make me successful, whole, and happy. All right? Now, these can be abstract things like uh, approval, control, power, security, comfort, success. We all run after these things. These can be concrete things, ideas like family or work or church school. These can be real, physical objects. Think about this. Uh, a television, or in our day, a computer, or how about a phone? Listen, these are image-making machines, is what they are. Putting images in our mind constantly, and we are constantly running to these things. It could be, it could be sports, it could be a car, it could be a house, it could be your stuff, clothing, membership in a certain organization. Anything that you trust, love, and pursue Give money to, run after, it changes your schedule. It could be an idol, a functioning God. How about this one? Anything we attempt to use to give us control over God. Now think about this one with me. Uh, even religion. In fact, I would say in this room here with us, Christian people mostly, um, I'd say primarily religion becomes an idol for many of us. And, and, and here's what I mean. Many, many Christians do this. We think, you know, if I accept Christ, then he, surely he's going to come through for me. And then, and then as we enter into relationship with him, we say, well, if I follow him, then surely my life will go a certain way. Uh, if I pray enough, he's going to answer my prayers. Watch out. We're rubbing the lamp often because we're thinking if he'll answer my prayers as I want him to, I'll continue to follow him. I'll continue to worship him. And when he doesn't, we stop worshiping him. We stop following. Why? Because we've created God in our own image. Voltaire is the one who said it. Uh, Mark Twain later said it. He quipped that, we, that God created us in his image and then we returned the favor. Right? We, we create God in our image, and when He doesn't come through for us, we stop following Him. We all know people like that. We've all been through seasons like that. Perhaps you're in a season like that now. You're wondering, God, why won't you, why won't you, you know, rescue me? I talked to one of my best friends I grew up with this week who's walking through a, a season of severe depression. I mean, debilitating kind of depression. He's not himself. And he's saying, Jeff, man, I'm, I'm telling you, I'm having a hard time. I'm having a hard time believing I'm having a hard time believing that God is good. I just want out of this. And some of you, maybe you're walking through that, and it causes us to really question our faith, to question Him. But what happens is we create God in our image. We want Him to come through for us. And when He doesn't, we stop worshiping Him. Because we have said He's going to be like this. This is what's wrong with the worst uh, work-based salvation. It says that I will, I will control God. I'll define the rules, right? I will craft for myself a measurable system of salvation. So now I'm in control. Watch that. I now am my own God in this self-salvation project, all right? So look at this next one. Anything we think gives us a complete picture of who God is and what He's about. Now I'm asking you to think deeply here because even Scripture itself can become an idol. Now, I mean, this, this is awesome. It is the Word of God. This is not God. This is not God. See, sometimes, and I'll just speak to some of us who maybe have been Christians for a long time, have been believers for a long time, even our doctrine can become an idol. I have figured this out. I mean, this can be a struggle for me. Somebody who studies Scripture all the time. I study the Word. I want to get it right. And I can say, you know what? I have figured this out. 
I've figured out my doctrine. This is what I believe. And if, 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 if you don't believe, this is where some people go, if you don't believe this, then, then you're way off. My doctrine perhaps has become an idol. I have figured God out. I've put him in a box. I can kind of rub him when I want to, and he'll come out and help me. And so even our, our understanding of God gets kind of mixed up. Our doctrine can become an idol. We, we have this sense of satisfaction. I have finally figured him out. And God says, I will not be figured out. I'm beyond your understanding. Now, yes, I have revealed myself in my word. And this is what we're going to see. Our worship of him must be word based. It's informed by scripture. But even watch this. Even in our worship, we can add to. I want you to think with me again. Think deeply about this because our gatherings are so important. But what we're talking about when we worship God is not simply the gathering. This is critical. It's so important for us to come together. What it is today, what we did today already in singing, we, it's been a, um, a discipline of remembrance. I mean, Carrie and the others are just saying, listen, let's sing these songs. Remember how much you're loved. Remember what Christ has done for you. Oh, praise the name of the Lord our God. Praise Him because of what He's done. And then watch this. Someday, when He returns, we're going to be totally forgiven, completely accepted by Him in reality. We're going to be right there. Behold Him. We're singing about those things. Remember where all this is heading. That's what our gatherings do. So important. But here's what happens. We often attach things, even in our gatherings, that become idolatrous. It's why in the, in the, in the, the Reformation, the Protestant Reformation, oh, some of the extremists went out. You know, It was really a, kind of a, pro, a protest against the Catholic Church. The Catholic Church was known, and still in some places, some ways, they have these icons, right? They have images. They have sculptures, or, or, or we've got to see Jesus. We've, we've created this thing in our image. I remember going to St. Basilica's uh, to, to, in Rome, and I walked in, and I mean, just the, it's awesome, but it's also kind of, yikes. Have you, anybody been there? Anybody been to St. Peter? It's just kind of, right, not just over the top, it's kind of, kind of gaudy, kind of, you know, and I'm an artist. I mean, I study this stuff in, in, in college, and, and I walked in, and there was the, the Pieta. I mean, it's basically, it's Michelangelo's um, Jesus is in the arms of Mary. And she's there. And I mean, it's, it's beautiful. It is awesome. It's stuff, again, that I studied in art. And I'm like, there it is. And this woman comes over and literally she comes in front of it and she just she just does like this. And she starts weeping and she starts, you know, doing the cross. And she just starts just worshiping this 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 sculpture. Now, later, I mean, and I thought, whoa, what's happening here? It's just an imp. This is not Jesus. This is not God. It's an image. Yes. And I suppose it could be, wow, this is reminding me of what Christ has done for me. I don't know what was going on in her mind. And I don't want to cast judgment. In fact, later I thought, dang, I should have been more moved by it. Like she was, perhaps. She's weeping over this. But you see, it gets real insidious, really sneaky, kind of, kind of crazy. It's why the Protestant reformers went off. They were destroying the idols of the Catholic Church. They would go in and crush the, the, you know, the icons and sculptures. They even destroyed the stained glass windows in churches. Why? Because they're like, no, no, no. You, these are images of the one true God, and you're worshiping, or you can't worship without those things. I mean, it's like somebody were to say, uh, I, I have to be in the sanctuary and I must see Jesus or I cannot worship. If I can't see Jesus, I can't worship. Idolatry is what that is. It le or at least it's a syncretism that says, I have to be, or how about, listen, here's what happens. And I'm, I'm seeing this in spades in our day. The hippest, coolest worship music, uh, I can worship God to that. The old hymns, not so much. I mean idolatry to say i have to worship god in this way listen you're not worshiping god you're worshiping that you're worshiping a form a style is what you're doing and friends we all do this and this is something worth thinking about talking about if you say i can only worship god in this space or in this place or when this music is going on or when that person is leading or preaching or what no 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 what you're doing is you're saying, I'm not worshiping God, I'm worshiping that thing. I'm worshiping an image of God that I have created for myself. And so we've got to be really clear that we're focused on Christ and we're worshiping Him alone, right? And our, and our, and our focus is always Him. It's why everything we do, whatever style or form, 
or whatever language, we're always pointing to Jesus because He's the one that we worship. How about this? Anything that gives us an inaccurate picture of who God is. Okay, so be careful when you say, I feel, and, and I want you to think, again, we could talk a long time about this, but think deeply about this. I, I, I feel so much closer to God when I do this. Now, I get it. There are certain times I feel more you know, closer to God than other times. Maybe in other places, creation kind of does that. For me, when I'm outside, I love that. But when you place a certain place or thing or something other than Christ Himself, that's, that's syncretism. That, that can be idolatry. I can only worship God when I'm doing this thing or when I'm over here or in this place. Or, or be careful when you, when you do this. Uh, when I think of God, I like to think of Him as... You ever heard somebody do that? Or how about this? I've heard this. I, just, I can't believe in a God who would do this. Again, you've created God in your own mind. If it doesn't match up with Scripture, then you have created a God who is of your own making, right? I've quoted Anne Lamott before. She's the one who said, um, if you believe that God hates the same people you hate, then clearly you've created Him in your own image. You see, we create our God in our own image so that He can be like a genie to us. And then Jesus comes and He says, no, you will worship me in spirit and in truth. And truth is found in His Word, all right? This is why the Scriptures are so important. The Scriptures inform our worship, not culture, not anything else. So we've got to first shut down the idol factory. Uh, you've got to be discerning about your idols. You've got to understand, we all run to them. We've said it before, whatever makes you anxious, whatever you worry about, maybe what makes you really happy, you know, has that thing become more important to me? than it should, or even more important than God, functionally. Because I'm giving my life, my time, my energy. I've said it before, what keeps you up at night? What makes you anxious? What do you worry about? You've got to identify it. Shut down the idol factory. And then second, you do this. Look, break down the idols you've been given. Shut down your idol-making factory, but you've got to destroy the idols you've inherited because they're all around us. This is not of your own doing. It's the culture we live in. This was true about the Israelites. Look at what it says in Deuteronomy 7 as the story moves on. You can see it on the screen there. He says this, But thus shall you deal with them, okay, these idol worshipers and idols. You shall break down their altars and dash in pieces uh, their pillars and chop down their ashram. This is God's idols and burn their carved images with fire. Now you read things like this, like, man, that's some violent stuff going on in the Old Testament. What's happening here? He says, no idols, break them down, tear them down. I don't want them in your life. I don't want them. Uh, I don't want you worshiping them. You got to break them down. So in verse five, look at this. Evidently, idol worship moves from one generation to another. This is why he's a jealous God. Look at what it says. You shall not bow down to them or serve them, for I, the Lord your God, am a jealous God, visiting the iniquity of the fathers on the, on the children of the third and fourth generation of those who hate me. Now, there's a generational curse on families who continue to worship idols. And we've got to think about this, parents and grandparents. As we pass our beliefs, what we say about God, what we, what we value the most is what we worship, and we're passing that on to our children. Now, God says He's a jealous God. Uh, now, many people struggle with this, but it's jealous in the way that one would have love for a spouse. See, what's happening here, and this is the way the rabbis understand the, um, uh, the, the, the covenant agreement that God is making with His people. It's a marriage relationship. I am your God, you're my people. Christ comes later. He's the groom. We are the bride of Christ. This is the whole arc of redemptive history. And here, God says, I will establish a covenant with my people. There's this I do moment, right? I commit to this. There's the exchange of the, of the, of the law that we're going to follow him. And this is why idolatry is called adultery in the Old Testament. And God says, I'm a jealous God. Because I love you, and I want you to have a relationship with me for your good and to my glory. So you see, he loves us in a way that, that, would, that would make him jealous, if you will. 
So we, we have all inherited some kind of idol. Now keep thinking with me. We've all inherited. We have idols that have been given to us, maybe from our parents. All right. Just a couple of examples. Um, maybe your parents were uh, subconsciously, maybe below the line, maybe not so much. Maybe they were prejudiced. Maybe they were racist. Maybe they taught you that your, uh, your ethnicity, all right, your color is supreme or ultimate and over all others. You came to believe, and most of us white, you came to believe that white is supreme or black or whatever. And if we were living somewhere else, it'd probably be the same way. We come to believe that we are somehow greater, better than others. Your race has become an idol. Maybe it's, um, gosh, as we move towards the 4th of July, this is, this is you know, really happening in our culture today. It's kind of a Christian nationalism. If our patriotism becomes an idol, and that's what happens. It's why in, in atheistic countries, the state becomes the idol, or even the ruler, the emperor, the person becomes the idol, because we can't but worship, right? And what happens in our culture is often we take good things, we make them God things, and this is certain, certainly the case when we think about um, you know, being an American. We make, that be, we make that an idol, and so we drape the, the, the flag over the cross, and we, we, we have a hard time distinguishing be, between the two when God has come for all people. He's not an American. He's not, he doesn't have a nationality. He would say, I'm not confined to that place or those people. I am the Lord God over all things. So we receive these things from our parents often, I think. You need to be discerning about that. And parents need to be discerning. What are you passing on? We receive uh, our idols from pop culture. Uh, you know, it's, it's, if it's trending, if it's popular, you're into it. And when it's no longer fashionable, you're moving on to the next, next thing, right? Maybe you're obsessed with the latest, greatest technology. You're obsessed with some, and as younger often happens, um, some pop star. We just want to be like them. We want to, we, we idolize, we call them teen idols. We worship them, in essence, because they shape and guide our identity and who we want to become. You see how insidious this is. How about from, uh, from our youth? Maybe it's uh, something you can't shake. Maybe it's an addiction or a personal sin or a mindset, that, uh, a belief that's become an idol. Maybe you were taught by your mom, women, that beauty is all that matters. And, and you've got to have the latest fashion, and you've got to be more beautiful. You've got to be, and it's become an idol. And some young men are taught that you've got to be strong. You've got to be this guy. You've got to be the athlete. And we push our kids, when in reality, we're kind of worshiping them, hoping they will provide for us. And as we do, we will crush our children. You see, this is so, so wrapped up, in, 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 and it's why you start to say, man, maybe my heart isn't an idol factory. Maybe it is after all. We get things even from our own minds. You come to believe certain things. That my identity, my worth is found in the approval of others. The performance of, of others. We believe lies about ourselves. That our identity is found somewhere other than God. But there's also this generational blessing. Okay, so there's a generational curse. But I want you to see, look at Exodus chapter 20, verse 6. All right, Look at verse 6. Look at what happens. There's this curse, but showing steadfast love to thousands of those who love me and keep my commandments, all right? So there's also this generational blessing. So here's what I would see as we close, um, as we kind of land this thing. Uh, first, we got to break down or we got to shut down the idol factory. Second, we got to break down our idols. And then thirdly, we got to lift up Christ in worship, okay? So watch, watch what happens here. There's this generational curse. Think about our first parents, Adam and Eve, uh, they, they were made in the image of God. Think about that. They were, they were in the image. They were made. We have been made in the image of God. But that wasn't enough for us. We didn't want to just be the image of the God and point to Him, bring glory to Him. We wanted to become God. And so they take of the fruit, believing it would be kind of like a genie if we just take a bite of this. If we eat this, we will become like God himself. So they took the fruit. And, 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 and so now God says, no, 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 no. Come back to me. He sends Christ to rescue us from our sin. And he says, now obey me. And you and I, we're, we're horrible at this. We, we, we struggle to obey him. And yet there is hope. Now, if you've been tracking with me all this time, you're going, man, this 
this message is tough. And is there any hope at all? And we got it, Jeff. There's idols everywhere. And, and I, I run to idols. But there's hope. Because if you think or feel that you have, have failed as an image bearer, listen, there is one. Here's the beauty of Christ. There's one who has come. He has come and he did not fail to bear the image of God. In fact, Colossians 1.15 says this, The Son is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn over all creation. He keeps the commands and he loves God perfectly. And he, 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 we realize he's, he's, he's royalty after all. You know, maybe uh, God is not so much like genie, uh, the genie. Jesus is not the genie. Maybe he's more like Aladdin. He shows up as a common Middle Easterner. And yet he's, he, we realize he's been royalty all the while. And he becomes the one who becomes the hero of the story. And so Jesus comes, and in Hebrews 1.3 it says, The Son is the radiance of the glory of God. Right, The exact representation of his being, sustaining all things by his powerful word. After he had provided purification for sins, he sat down at the right hand of the majesty on high. Jesus comes, and he rescues us. And watch this. Here's why there's hope. When we receive His grace, He covers us in His righteousness. So friends, listen, when you worship God, when we sing to Him in our gatherings, when you worship Him this week, your worship is pleasing to God. It is acceptable to Him because Christ, the perfect image of God, has come and not only becomes the means for our worship, He is the object of our worship. And when we worship, You could say that Christ is covering us and He, the great mediator, is worshiping for us, in us. In spirit, you can worship Him now. And you can worship Him in truth because we've seen Christ for who He is. So how do we get free from idols? First, confess your idols to Christ. Daily, constantly. They're like weeds. They just keep coming back. They're like mosquitoes. We think we got rid of them and they keep on coming back. But Christ has overcome and we can overcome. Secondly, repent of your idols. So turn from your idols. That's my hope today. Shut down, break down, repent and turn from your idols. Thirdly, allow the word of God to inform your worship. Romans 10, 17 says it's by it's through faith that comes through hearing the word of Christ that we know how to worship Him. We know who He is. It doesn't say, through music, we're going to we're gonna come to know who He is. We're gonna, through some experience, we're going to come to know who He is. No, through the preaching of the Word of Christ and the truth of His Word is how we know who He is. And by the Spirit speaking into our hearts. So you've got to know God's Word. I'm going to encourage you to join the church, to be a part of a connect group that's learning the Scriptures and growing to understand exactly who He is and then worship Christ alone. All right, so here's what I want to do. I want us to close our time, and we're going to sing. We're going to sing another song, a part of a song that we've sung. We're going to worship Him as we go into this week, okay? So Carrie and the crew are going to come up, and I just want you to, let's do this. Let's all stand together, and I'm going to pray over us as we are going to sing our way out. And I don't want you to run out. Um, We have a moment here, and I want you to just bow your head and close your eyes with me, and I want you to consider the fact that Christ has come And if you've received His grace, that you have been rescued from your sin. You are in Christ. You're totally forgiven, completely loved, fully accepted by Him. And you can worship Him in spirit and in truth. And so as we enter into the week, I want us for just one moment to worship the One who is the Lord our God. And I want you to bring your praise to Him and be reminded of who you are what He has done, and where all of history is headed. So, Lord God, we worship You. You are the One who has created us, and You are the One that we praise and worship. So we praise the name of the Lord, our God. Let's worship Him. Thank you for taking time to watch this sermon. If you would like more information about our church or following Jesus, please go to our website, pcbc.org, or contact our church offices. We hope to see you next week at church.